Great to have you here on the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is to serve you with advice and information that empowers you so you can make better financial decisions in your life. Today is so much fun for me. <laughs> I get to embark on my weekly self-improvement journey with our Clark Stink segment. And i got to tell you something funny about Clark Stinks, Krista. What? An old friend and I were talking uh, last week, and he, and he starts bellowing, laughing. He's not somebody who usually does that. And he's going on and on about how much he loves Clark Stinks. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was, it was funny. He said, I never miss it. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he has some passive aggressive I stuff. I can't that imagine <laughs> that one of your friends would. <laughs> so it's Friday. Mm -hmm. Traffic patterns completely different now on Fridays than other days of the week. And the old expression, you working hard or hardly working. There's a trend about how Fridays are turning out so different than other days. And I actually like it. I think it's a good thing. But Without further ado, it's time for belly laking, belly slapping. You must think I'm pretty stupid. You should be ashamed of yourself. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're right, pal. Clark stinks worse than a pile of burning tires. I agree that tires should be rotated regularly, but only if it's free. With many places, dealerships in particular, charging 50 to over $100 to rotate your tires, what? it's not worth it. What? By the time you pay for having your tires rotated several times, you could have paid for a new set of tires or even a couple of new sets of tires. Even if you wait until 7,500 miles to rotate your tires, you could end up rotating them 10 times. And it, if it costs $75 each time, that is highway robbery, Doug. Okay, Doug, you just educated me on something I've never heard of having to pay to have tires rotated. Tesla does that. They charge you? Yeah, it's like $65. To rotate your tires? Mm -hmm. They just offered it to me because I have a mobile service coming. Wow. Yep. Okay, I, I'm, I think I'm it was really shocked. I guess because I always buy my tires at Costco and they have the free rotation yeah. It never occurred well, to me. The place where I bought these tires does that too, so I'm not going to get the Tesla one. Oh, they rotate for free? Yeah. Okay. Tesla. Okay. Okay. My dear Stinky Clark, your advice on mutual bonds is way off. Individual mutual mu bonds? Municipal. It says municipal bonds. Municipal. Yeah, that's not what you said. Oh, I said mutual. I'm sorry. I stink. I was trying to figure out what a mutual bond was. I stink. Your advice on municipal <laughs> bonds is way off. Individual municipal bonds, depending on the state laws and what's purchased, are perfect investments or perhaps savings tool. They would be the same as a federal and state tax-free long-term CD or income stream. If I purchase a highly rated AAA or AA tax-free $10,000 municipal bond that usually pays between 3 to 5%, I can either let the interest accumulate or have it paid to me tax-free until the bond matures or is called. And when the bond matures or is called, I get back the original $10,000. Municipal bonds should not be viewed as investments, but as tax-free savings. I think you need to review your thoughts and advice on this. Mike. Mike, thank you. Uh, you pointed out one of the reasons, though, that you need to be a really sophisticated buyer to buy um single issue uh, municipal bonds, you know, buy them direct issue, because you talked about callable. That's something that has so flummoxed people over the years. They buy one at a good rate when interest rates are higher. They think, wow, I'm set for this for, you know, 20, 30 years, whatever. And then interest rates go down and then it's a callable and they're like, what's that? And they get paid off on the bond and they lose one of the advantages and that's why i like except for a sophisticated municipal bond buyer which obviously you know the business you understand how to buy them i prefer municipal bond funds where you have professionals handling the buying who know how the game is played and know how to build a portfolio and even single state in many cases uh, vanguard is the most uh, sophisticated 
issuer of municipal bond funds. They know how to buy them. They have a lot of single state funds. So if someone is not at your level of sophistication, I'd say they're still better off in a municipal bond fund than they are in buying individual issues. Just my opinion. When speaking about taking prescriptions to multiple pharmacies, you mentioned that pharmacists don't have time to look up drug interactions. Yes, Clark's accurate that we are overworked as ever before, but as a pharmacist, I was appalled to hear this oversight. Reviewing drug interactions is the most important part of our job, and we catch so many issues that can be life-threatening, including drug interactions, wrong dose, wrong directions, wrong quantity, and drug duplications. Patients who see many doctors will have all have their prescriptions come to us, and by coming to one pharmacy, we are able to catch these issues. Please ask the friendly pharmacist at Costco about what their job entails, and thank you for helping me learn to save for my future, Kasim. Kasim, thank you very much for that. The drug interaction problem and the uh, the drugs being, you know, that the pharmacist doesn't know you're taking this, that, and the other. Um, I have a list on my phone of every prescription I take, what the dosage is and all that. And uh, if I ever end up filling a prescription out of town or whatever, I'm not at my normal, in my case, Costco pharmacy. And I want to thank you for, obviously, your dedication to your patients that come to you. I am so worried about the problems of pharmacists being way overworked and the errors that come with it. And I've talked about that before, involving the scandals with CVS. And this is, this is serious stuff when somebody loses their health or life because the pharmacists are so overworked they're not able to do their job like they should and obviously even with how overworked you are you're making sure that things are done right for every one of your patients clark you don't necessarily stink but may be uninformed you recently spoke about purchasing a vehicle from various areas in the country when your home state is different than where you purchased and said that sales tax does not matter. You are correct that where you reside is where you register and have to worry about the sales tax, but sales tax can play an important part of the decision of purchasing a vehicle in a different state. A state like Florida will not recognize the excise tax paid on a vehicle purchased in Georgia when you register in Florida. So you may be hit with two separate taxes instead of just Florida's sales tax. I would simply suggest that you have your listeners verify the tax situation in their home state if they look at purchasing outside of that state. Thank you for all you do, Scott. Scott, thank you very much for that. And uh, normally, when you buy a uh, car in one state, you pay the taxes on the purchase of that car in the other state. Or if you do have to pay taxes, most states credit you back for that. And if Florida is not doing that, Gosh, that's terrible, and that's something I appreciate you letting me know. Clark, you really don't stink, but I can compare you to a durian fruit, smelly on the outside but packed with nutrients on the inside. Like you, I also love to travel, so I'm always excited when you give advice on saving money when traveling. However, there are two things we do differently. First, I don't go to a place simply because they're offering bargains. I go to a place because I'm interested in that specific place on my bucket list, so to speak. Second, when I travel, I don't just go with the flow. I have an itinerary of places I would like to visit. For me, it is better to have a list of things and places I would like to see in a country or city rather than wander around without a specific target. That would be a waste of time. I'm flexible, of course, adjusting the schedules of my visit to a specific site if necessary, but at least at the end of my vacation, I've checked off my list. If there's a place I missed, then that's something to look forward to when I do come back. The world is such a big place, and thank you for your advice, especially on how to save on hotels, tours, and airfare, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, thank you very much. And that's the wonder of travel, is everybody gets out of travel uh, what they want, hopefully, and everybody has a different style. I am so um, just uh, freeform when I travel. And, you know, we recently, as we shared with you weeks ago, we had our staff trip recently to Italy. And we were in, my wife and I were in Rome for a very short period of time where we all met. And we were just wandering around and it's like, we had, we had, weren't using GPS nothing. And, oh, there's the Spanish steps. 
oh, there's the Pantheon. Oh, there's the, the ruins. I mean, we were we were so casual about it. And I know that's not how most people like to travel, but it is just for us like just the wonder of wandering is what we enjoy. And if if you are somebody who enjoys more going with an organized schedule and all that, go for it. Sorry, not really a Clark Stinks message, but after hearing yet again how some are critical of Clark's old Eiffel Tower decision to forego the money on the elevator and instead use the stairs, my wife and I wanted to chime in with our support. No way would we pay for the elevator when we could take the stairs. It's the better choice for several reasons. I always love walking and wandering in Paris, and in case it matters, note that it's Rick Steve's recommendation, too. Take the stairs if you can, Dean. <laughs> And then I'll, Thank you, Dean. Yeah, I'll follow up with this one, um, which shows that you cannot please everyone. <laughs> I would never say Clark stinks, but there is way too much talk of travel. I think he should start a second podcast for just travel and focus on other subjects with the current podcast. I've been listening for decades. You seem like a genuinely kind and honest person. Thank you for all the help you've given me over the years, Jennifer. Jennifer, thank you. You know, we actually used to do that. And we used to do travel advice as the Friday flyer, mm -hmm. you know, because Friday was a great day to do something more leisure oriented and all that. And uh, we've never talked about doing a travel podcast. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea. Yeah. So um, just when I start talking about uh, travel, just start humming or something, Jennifer, so it doesn't bother you. I love Sorry, to travel. Jennifer. So it just, it just, comes out of my pores. I love it so yeah. much. And when I say you can't please everyone, Jennifer, Jennifer, I just mean, you know, one person's like, I love the travel, and then you don't like the travel. You just, it's hard to figure out the balance, but we try our best. And my wife was going on a harangue again about something is definitely wrong with me that I love being in airports. We talked you about that on the, the podcast recently. Yeah. yeah, she just is like, what is wrong with you? Anyway. <laughs> We don't have enough time for all of that. <laughs> Coming up ahead, speaking of Fridays being different, wow, the pandemic caused a shift in Fridays that is still playing out. And I actually love it. COVID changed so many things. Uh, there was the tragedy of COVID. And then the adaptability we learned about life from COVID. And we had this divide in America where people who had to be present to do their jobs, you're not going to fix somebody's heating and air conditioning system over an iPad. You have to be there. Uh, so many jobs had to be in person. And we had the, the people we referred to as the heroes. They were out there. Uh, when COVID was so contagious and tragically took a million and a half lives of our fellow Americans. But we learned to adapt and we had people who were in office type jobs that went from being president in office to remote and things went on and work continued and it was amazing the productivity that continued. But more and more companies have gone back to being in person or they're doing the hybrid thing and the Wall Street Journal did a story recently about how people work differently on Fridays than other days of the week and there's a chart showing that how many people don't go to a physical office on Friday it's almost half much higher than any other day of the week and in terms of how much people work on Fridays, people beg off from working a lot earlier, at least a full hour earlier. People say, I'm done. And you can hear this in traffic reports in any major city. The traffic reporters will tell you that Friday afternoon traffic is completely different than it used to be. And that the Friday rush hour is much earlier than it is the other days of the week. Exercise classes are much busier 
Friday afternoon than other afternoons of the week because a lot of people are saying, hey, I'm done earlier in the day. The boss may not like it, but I'm done earlier in the day. So some bosses have absolutely adapted and they're allowing people to work till noon or whatever on Friday and then they're done. And oddly, some of these businesses say they're getting more productivity in a half day on Friday than they used to get a full day on Friday because people know the deal. Get your work done in a concentrated period of time and you're done. I mean, it's, it's something to me that is really a positive is that nobody... No, there's an old expression, a dying man never wished he spent more time at his work. And we in America have been way too work-oriented, in my opinion. And having Friday is kind of like, almost like a flex day, is, I think, a good thing for society. Yeah, when we before COVID, we um, always gave... Everyone who, when we were in the office full time, we gave everybody Friday work from home day um, because the traffic was like the worst on Fridays. And so it just gave people more time in their lives. They could start their weekends whenever. And it worked really well. I remember an executive from another company once said to me, like, how can you do that? Like, I don't think you should be doing that. How do you know people are working, getting productivity? And I was like, well, it's pretty clear for us what people are doing. Um, and now that company has to give people flex days. <laughs> I don't know what that person's thinking about but it. But you know, uh, it, what's really funny about it, because we were doing that before COVID. We'd done it for years and years and years. When COVID came, people were so used to collaborating with online tools that we didn't have one second hiccup going to working remotely. Yeah. So we were lucky that way. Okay. In an unlucky time. We'll go to questions. Mike in Ohio says, I transferred 29 months of my post 9-11 GI bill to my daughter, and she also has about $72,000 in a 529 plan. Wow. Yeah. She's going to start physical therapy school in a few months, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to use these resources. She'll be going to school in the Northeast, and housing is costly. I can vouch for that. In addition to covering her tuition and fees, we estimate that the GI Bill will provide $2,600 a month for housing, food, et cetera. Due to the high cost of living in the area, are we able to use any of the 529 for her housing and other living expenses? After doing some house hunting, it looks like $2,600 monthly allowance will cover the housing and little else. Will we be able to use any of the 529 for living expenses? You might be able to, because it's based on the prevailing cost for those ancillary expenses like housing at the college that she's going to. So under the 529 plan rules, there are many eligible things that you're able to use it, use the funds for. And if you go to savingforcollege.com, we have our own 529 plan guide. But savingforcollege.com does a lot about the eligible categories and the amounts you can use the money for college. But there's something else here as well. If she's able to defray some of her expenses using the 529, you may or may not be aware, Mike, you're going to be able to take 35000 of what's in that 72000 and convert it tax-free into Roth IRA money for your daughter. It is a new benefit this year. You'll be able to gradually migrate money tax-free from the 529 into a Roth IRA. So you don't need to blow through all 72,000 for her or face tax consequences. Uh, by the way, in the kind of situation she's in, if you did decide to cash out 529 money after she finishes education, because you can demonstrate that expenses were covered by the GI Bill, there will be no 10% penalty. There will just be tax owed on the earnings that she has in the 529 account. But between being able to convert money 
into a Roth IRA for her and be able to defray some expenses over the next couple of years that would be eligible expenses, uh, you should be okay and have very little tax burden from this. You are also going to have the option that if you end up with any grandkids, you're going to be able to change the beneficiary designation on the 529 after you've done the various uh, spending you can do or transferring you can do to the benefit of another family member, naming them as the beneficiary as a tax-free transaction. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank you for your years of service to our great nation in the U.S. military. Noah in Georgia says, I'm 25 and I'm planning on buying a condo or house five to 10 years from now. I'm maxing out my retirement accounts and have extra money I'd like to save towards buying. I'm renting right now. How would you recommend saving this money? I'm thinking of doing a mix of stocks and bonds, maybe 60-40, but I wanted to get your advice. Thanks again for all you do. I've been listening to you for 15 plus years. Wait, wait, wait. You've been listening since you were like nine or 10 years old? Wow. This is fantastic. And Noah, here you are with all this money from living on less than what you make. This is incredible. So your five to 10 year window, your supposition is perfect. Doing, uh, you could just do a balance fund that do exactly that. They do, most often a balance fund will be 60% stocks, 40% bonds. The idea is with an intermediate window of your case, five to 10 years, that that should, in a normal economic cycle, outrun what you could earn in savings or CDs with better tax treatment with relatively low risk. And so if you wanted to really lower the risk, you could instead buy two funds. You could buy a total stock market index fund for 40% of the money and buy a total bond index fund for 60% of the money, and that would still give you stock exposure, but very low risk from that combination, and more flexibility having it in two index funds, very good tax treatment, and that would be a good potential holding for a five to 10 year window. And I wanna point out again, we are not investment advisors, this is general advice and guidance, and Noah already is on that right track and living on so much less than you make, Noah, that you've fully funded retirement accounts each year, you have excess funds you're throwing off, you are creating so much financial independence in your life, it's incredible. Mike in Alaska says, I've been listening to your show since I was a young man working on my family farm in South Dakota. Thank you for decades of free education. I'm currently living in a remote Alaskan border town where I own several businesses. Well, you're a tough guy. Yeah. <laughs> Our banking choice is limited to one of the big banks. You want me to name them? Oh, sure. Wells Fargo. And they are starting to charge us to deposit cash. Since my family is physically in Canada often for shopping and visiting, I'm contemplating taking some of my cash, 10000 Canadian max per visit per Canadian law, to Canada and depositing it into a personal bank account. I would then use this account for ATM withdrawals and any other expenditures in Canada. The remainder would be transferred to an online bank where it would draw interest and then when and if needed, I could transfer it to my U.S. account. Flexibility is important to me. Is this a good idea? I don't mind the complication if it means that I don't have to give Wells Fargo any extra fees. Am I going to pay a lot in transfer fees? If this is a good idea, which bank, Canadian or online, do you recommend? Okay, so we got a lot to unpack here. First, Canada uh, has a lot of credit unions, even in more remote corners of the country. And if a credit union is available across the border, that would be a better choice than uh, Canada has the same problem we do with uh, not very customer friendly giant monster mega banks. So going with a credit union across the border would be a superior choice if one is available in that remote corner of Canada. Second thing, there are CPA firms that do tax that specialize in people who have 
income or assets in both Canada and the United States because the laws are crazy awful tax laws involving having income or assets in both the US and Canada. Um, a lot of the specialty firms are in Michigan but deal with people all over the United States. Um, so this is not a decision to take lightly just because Wells is ripping you off on cash deposits. Um, because you gotta make sure you don't create a tax nightmare or a tax monster for yourself by having money working both in the US and Canada. I love it. Um, I love how tough you are. You went from the already cold winters in South Dakota working on a family farm that just wasn't cold <laughs> enough or dark enough for you that you got to spend your winters in a frontier town at the Canadian-Alaska border. You are so many times tougher than I am. I can't even begin to tell Crazy. you. Crazy. I can't believe how short-sighted it is of Wells that they would charge him to deposit cash. I mean, I guess it's a Well, I mean, the big thing. banks, it's the, it's the only bank in town. Yeah. The big bank. Several They're looking businesses, for every way to you know? fee people. Yeah. And so uh, his choices are so limited. And, you know, this thing with charging for depositing cash, they're banks that we bailed out. How many times? I mean, it's just, it's disgusting. You should also sit down, by the way, Mike, with the branch manager at the Wells location and tell them that you're going to not have money with them anymore, except what you have to, unless they can waive this fee. Mm -hmm. And maybe the branch manager can waive the fee for you. But how crazy it is that banks that are semi-public, that are subsidized by the U.S. taxpayer with the full backing of, of us, we bailed them out for trillions of dollars back after the banking scandals of 07, and now they want to charge you to deposit something that, uh, again, what does U.S. money say? Do you remember? I don't remember. <laughs> This note, here's my dollar. Those of you who watch the YouTube show, see I have a dollar right here uh, with George on the cover. It says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, unless you bank with a giant monster <laughs> mega bank, in which case we're going to charge you to receive your cash. My goodness. Who comes up with policies like that? And whatever happened to MBA school? <laughs> you always teach, do this. They don't teach morals and ethics. You have an MBA. I have an saying. MBA, so I can say it. <laughs> I mean, always looking to cut that corner on your customers. Just, oh, doesn't make you the smartest person in the room when you come up with a scheme like that. Anyway. I should be talking about lighter, happier things because it's Friday. Yes, have a great weekend. It's the weekend. And besides, we just heard people cut out early. You want to leave early? Bye. Why don't you leave? <laughs> have an absolutely great weekend. Remember what we're about. You saving more, spending less, avoiding getting ripped off. And we never stop working. Clark.com, ClarkDeals.com, open 24 hours a day to serve you all weekend long and enjoy yourself.